Tea is, after water, the most consumed beverage in the world. In Europe, if some countries like the UK are famous for their tea drinking culture, it is less known that the old continent has its own domestic tea production. Tea is only grown in one location commercially in Europe, the northern coast of the Portuguese island of São Miguel, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and adapted very well to the local climate and soil, creating a product with unique characteristics and traditions. But how did tea arrive there? To understand that, we need to go back to the origins of tea in Europe. The original heartland of tea is the massive area called the Eastern Himalayan Corridor. It's a huge area covering the provinces of Sichuan and Yunnan in China, Northern Thailand, as well as Burma and part of Northeast India. It's in this area that wild tea trees originated. The people living in this region ate tea for centuries, perhaps even millennia, before ever consuming it as a beverage. People would nibble on the leaf row, add them to soups or greens, ferment them or pickle them. You can still find some of this tradition nowadays, like in Burma where tea salad is still a very common dish. However, when it comes to the history of tea as a beverage, scholars believe that it likely originated in what is known the southwest of China, more specifically the Yunnan province during the Shang Dynasty, as a medicinal drink. From there, the drink spread to Sichuan province, and it's believed that there, for the first time, people began to boil tea leaves for consumption into a concentrated liquid without the addition of all the leaves or herbs, thereby using tea as a bitter yet stimulating drink rather than a medicinal concoction. When these territories were incorporated into the Chinese empire under the Qin dynasty, the tea drinking culture started to spread more widely within the empire. However, until the Tang Dynasty, tea drinking was primarily a southern Chinese practice. Tea was disdained by the northern dynasty's aristocrats, who describe it as a slave drink. It became widely popular during the Tang Dynasty when it was spread to Korea, Japan and Vietnam. The first recorded contact with the Western word, with tea, happened much later, for a small country on the ages of Europe. Portugal. During the 16th century, Portugal was established as a respected sea power and trading nation. Portuguese were among the first to sail along the coast of Africa all the way to India. It is during this period that the Portuguese made the first direct contact with the Chinese through the port of Macau. Indeed, the Portuguese expedition to the Orient brought missionaries in contact with tea. It is likely that these missionaries first brought tea to Europe. However, if the Portuguese were the first to come back to Europe with tea, it is the Dutch and the English that must be credited for the widespread export of the beverage in the Western world during the 18th century. For more than a century, Holland retained a near-complete monopoly over the imports of tea and introduced it to Europe. This curiosity from the Far East was first adopted by the aristocracy of the Netherlands and France, which at the end of the 17th century was the largest foreign buyer of tea. However, it was not adopted by the masses in these countries. The only country where tea drinking took root in Europe on a massive scale was England. It is a woman who is credited for the mainstream adoption of tea in the British Isles, the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, who married in 1662 the King Charles II of England. Britain's new queen had always loved tea and brought with her, as part of her dowry, a chest of fine Chinese tea. She began serving the tea to her aristocratic friends at court, and word of the exotic royal beverage spread quickly. As nice as this legend is, it is most likely unfunded, as aristocracy was already trading tea with the Dutch way before she became queen. Most likely, several things contributed to this widespread adoption. First, different doctors in Europe popularized tea as a medicinal drink, able to cure many different illnesses. 
In parallel, tea became a central aspect of aristocratic society, especially driven by noble women, which merged together several practices to create a very strong English tea tradition. Indeed, the practice from the Dutch colonies to add sugar to tea, as well as the habit from the French to add milk, were adopted by the English and greatly helped to make the beverage more palatable to a large number of people. The English gentry also adopted the afternoon tea practice from France and Holland, to which they added scones, clotted cream and pastries. Soon drinking tea became a domestic ritual among families, colleagues and friends who were just wealthy enough to afford it, which also increased demand. The association between tea and respectability soon became ingrained in the British culture. By the 19th century, tea had reached the working class, where it was associated with work and considered a necessity. The stimulants in the tea and the extra calories provided by sugar and accompanying snacks would give workers energy to finish the day's work. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle is to be found in the direct increase in supply available in Europe. As volume of imported tea increased, price also decreased, which made it more easily available to a wider range of people. It is in this already booming European consumer market that the Azores started to make tea. During the 19th century, the island of San Miguel was mainly known for its export of oranges. However, after a terrible plague that ravaged the orchards, Azorians diversified their export by cultivating several exotic crops like pineapples, tobacco or tea. The cultivation of tea was introduced in the Azores by Jacinto Leite in about 1820. Jacinto started the first plantation in his native San Miguel using seeds brought from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, where he was stationed as commander of the royal guards in the court of Dom João VI. The climate of the island proved to be good for the crops, and the cultivation of tea slowly gained support, while at the same time, the production and export of oranges, which until then represented the largest part of the island's economy, was fading. In 1860, a farmer named José do Canto had a bunch of seeds shipped over from Japan and India. He was a key figure in the development of tea in San Miguel. It was followed by quite a few other farmers, but very quickly they all realized that they had no idea of how to grow tea, let alone process it into a commercially viable product. For this reason, José do Canto hired a Chinese tea master who came all the way from China to San Miguel to teach the local farmers how to farm tea on their own soil. This Chinese tea expert was called Lo Apan and became quite famous on the island. His impact on San Miguel's agricultural landscape was very important. And the story goes that he was paid in both cash and opium for his services. By the early 20th century, 14 separate factories were functioning and almost 50 tea plantations were thriving on the island. Tea production reached its peak in the 1850s with about 250 tons produced from more than 300 hectares. However, the First World War and custom policies that protected tea from Mozambique severely affected San Miguel's tea industry. By 1966, there remained only five out of the original 14 tea manufacturers. Right now, only two tea factories exist on the island. Chagoreana, the oldest, as well as the only tea factory on the island, which has had an uninterrupted production history since its founding. The other tea factory is called Cha Porto Formoso. It was founded in the 1920s and produced tea until the 80s, after which the production stopped for a couple of years until it was decided to restart the production as well as create a museum in 1998. It is precisely to one of these remaining factories that I had decided to go. However, it was quite far from Punta Delgada, the capital of the island, and I had decided to discover on the way to the factory the marvels of the island.
At long last, I had reached Chagurian, the largest still active tea factory in San Miguel. Family owned and operated since 1883, when Emelinda Gagu de Camara and her son José Honoratu opened the factory selling the first production of teas under the Guriana name. And nowadays, Guriana plantation covers 32 acres and produces about 33 tons per year. It is the oldest tea plantation in Europe. The factory is really a unique place on the island, with rows of tea trees as far as the eyes can see. And its original processing machines from the early 1900 still in use. It is possible to take a self-guided tour across the factory to learn about tea, or just sit and enjoy the delicious beverage, as well as nice pastries. I had the chance to ask a few questions to Madalena Mota, the sixth generation heir to the factory and current CEO of Chacoriana. Many reasons led to the demise of tea manufacturers in San Miguel following World War I. They first had to compete with tea from the then Portuguese colony of Mozambique, which had the advantage of cheap labor as well as low custom taxes, while Azorian tea had to pay high taxes in order to export their tea to Lisbon. As tea is quite a labor-intensive industry, it requires a lot of people, especially when doing tea in the orthodox way which quickly becomes expensive. Local manufacturers had a hard time competing with international tea, which had access to very cheap labor. They also were badly impacted by the intense immigration of thousands of Azoreans to the United States, which reduced the local population and as such, their local customer base. By the 1980s, only Chagoriana was left in the island. But how did they survive? while the other 13 manufacturers disappeared. The reason we are uh, alive, it's because my great-grandfather, he put the um, energy by water. It's why it's, it's like that. So the, the price uh, can... So you less labor. Yes. If my great-grandfather did make that... Um, uh, how, you, how you call it? The, the, our energy? Mm -hmm. We were close. When he put the, the, the energy in the tea factory, was a crazy thing that he made in that time. There's no light in, in the highland, and we were the first ones to have lights. So we were in the top. But it was so expensive that my great grandfather he had many have had many problems money problems. But that uh, dream he had, it's what he made us alive today. Then, then after the revolution, we were going to close the tea factory because the economy in the highlands, they are uh, focused in cows. But my father, my father was the one that didn't uh, close the factory. The, the politician from the, the politics, after the, the, the 25th of April, they told my father to take off the tea and put cows. But my father, was um, his passion was the, the tea factory and the employers. He, said, he always said, what, I'm, what they are going to do? So my father went to make another business to, buy, to, to pay this business. She had a car business, she was a mayor, he was a mayor. He made many things for this to be open. Because in that time, the tea uh, plantation, the tea, the Goriana was a um, lost business. But because of this passion of the, the employers here, and my father, we are hoping and now we are well. We, we make black tea and green tea. Black tea, it's oxidated. First, the, the, the leaves are coming to the, the tea factory. Then they stay for 12, uh, 12 hours, more or less, in a place for the leaves to be more softer. Then they come to these machines here, that are here, and they make this movement like that. For the, the leaves are smashed, and then the, the juice, can, juice can hold 
to stay black. If I make green tea, it goes to a, a machine that is a steaming, so the process of oxidation is stopped. Then in the leaves, I make orthodox way that the leaves are always separated by size. First leaf, it's orange pico, the little leaf from the, the, the tea plantation, the tea. And give the, the orange pico, it's more uh, aromatic and it's a five o'clock tea. The second leaf, it's pico, it's a young leaf, but not so young as, and as the, the first leaf and gives a very strong tea. It's a morning tea. Then we have broken leaf. It's the third leaf and it's more old and it's very light tea. And it's good to make blends. We make blends with this tea, we, we mix with other herbs. Then we have the green tea from the first leaf that it's more high quality. And then the second, the, the Hinson that it's with the second and the third leaf and it's more um, soft. And then we make huer, olong, and cushion, but it's for the specific sauces of tea. In 2011, Chacuriana was offered the prestigious brand Chacantu by Maria Jardin Hintze, another condition that the brand was to be relaunched and maintained on the market as a tribute to its founder, José Ducantu. Of all the tea factories in the Azores, Chacantu was the most emblematic both in the archipelago and in mainland Portugal. Currently, the brand Chacantu is mostly used by Chagoreana for its blends with jasmine to create jasmine tea or with bergamot to create some kind of earl grey. Yes, the, the, the land is acid. The, the tea, because I have too much rain, the, the roots are very big, so um, it gives a tea very um, fresh. English call our tea fresh. A tea from other countries because of the, the climate and the land are very aggressive. The green tea have a fishy taste, like a fishy taste in the end. We don't have this fishy taste because the, the land is acid and the rain, so uh, it's very fresh. It's easy to drink our tea. We work with the university from Azores and they are always making uh, analysis of, of the tea. And uh, our green tea is uh, one that have more antioxidants in the world of teas. We and another blend from China, we are the, the ones that have more antioxidants. In addition to this tea being fresh and well balanced, I noticed one thing that was really unusual about Chagoriana tea. It never ever gets bitter or develops harsh tannins, even after the tea has been left infusing for too long. This quality really sets Azorian tea apart compared to other teas in the world. This characteristic of Azorian tea can be explained in different ways. Most likely climate has a part to play in that but also the tea variety cultivated here. As over the years, the tea plant that were brought to the island became very well adapted to the local environment and through different selection became different from the rest of the tea plants used for making tea elsewhere. Now we have a um, Azorian plant, we can say, because come plants from India, from China, from Brazil, and the plants now are mixed because of the bees. And we have a plant that is very strong with the wings that come from the sea. So now we have a azorean plant. And we don't have diseases. So we are biologic but because of the nutrients of them. We export to Germany. Germany is our first buyer. They buy us the value, the more expensive tea. Of course, we, we, we sell a lot in Portugal, in, but the high quality tea the, goes to, to Germany. And in Germany, we have two generations of uh, uh, people that drink tea from Goriana. So they are always, they can buy other teas 
to, to, take, to uh, taste. But they are going to have always my tea in the kitchen because it was the tea that the grandmother drank. Mm. And uh, we, we sell to United States and Canada because we are more Azorians in America and Canada than in Azores. So we sell there, in the mainland and in here. And France, a lot of green tea in France. We, we make a project called Portugal 2020. It's a European project that it's uh, with um, investigation. So, because we are a, a very small uh, factory, a family factory, we have a partner uh, with the University from Azores. And Professor Batista and Dr. Elizad, they are always making um, investigation with the tea, with our tea. So we develop a new tea that it's coming and it's going to be a new tea in the world of tea. It's a tea that is very um, rich in tannin. Tannin is good for your brain, make you focus. For, for people with the Alzheimer problem, it's, it's good for them, but for us too. And it's going to be an innovation in the world of tea. And this tea in rich in tannin, uh, only can be picked March to, April, to May, then September to October, when the sun are not so high, and so it's have more tea. Then we made another tea. This tea is going out next year, but last year we make tea, green tea with herbs from Azores. The university studied the herbs that our grandfathers drink in tea sands, and they are uh, good for uh, specific problems. So we mix with the tea and it's uh, the innovation. My father always told me that there, there is no the, the best in the world. He says always that it didn't exist. I was very small when he told me that and I didn't understand. Now that I'm almost 15 years old, um, I understand what he said. The best tea is the tea from your grandfather because tea gives you memories. If you know about tea, you can see that the, this one, this tea is very good, this one it's not so good, but the tea that you drink with your family, it's the tea that it's going to be on your side always. Mm -hmm. In Azores, you, you don't you don't go to a, a coffee and drink tea to a coffee shop uh, because tea is something that you drink with your family. We drink a lot of tea, but it's a, a, tea, a, a drink that you uh, drink with your family. With uh, if you are sad, you drink a tea. If you are happy, you drink wine. Then you drink tea. If you you come uh, very from your job, you drink tea. If you have a, a discussion with your wife, your wife say, oh, let's go to drink a tea. It's something a family drink. After a big dinner, a family lunch, we drink tea. It's not a drink that you drink on the street. Awesome. Not like the Chinese that make that ceremony and it's very a thing. Uh, Chinese, they think a lot when they're making the tea. We know, we, we, we drink tea, it's a family drink. It's more casual. Yes, and it's a happy, happy drink. <laughs> <laughs> to make our salt happy. Over more than 150 years, the Azores have built a strong tea tradition that cannot be found anywhere else in Europe. What started as an alternative to the declining orange industry has turned into a culture embraced by the islanders in their everyday life. This was endangered at the turn of the millennium, but thanks to dedicated people like the Mota family, this tradition remained strong and endured. Adapting to new times and being rediscovered by tourists from all over the world in various forms, Chagoriana has been working on new projects and partnerships to bring innovation to the tea of the island. 
their tea has now been incorporated in a delicious beer, as a liquor, and if you go to the village of Furnes in San Miguel and brew the green tea with the local water, you can enjoy a purple tea. This overall renewed interest has motivated new people to make tea in the island, as shown by the new tea plantation in the Setesidades village. And more globally in Europe, many enthusiasts have been pioneering projects of tea plantations and are starting to create a real tea industry, like it is the case in Cornwall and Brittany. Europe may well emerge in a couple of decades as a new major actor in the world of tea. I hope that you enjoyed this video. As always, please like and subscribe if you like this content. I will leave the details of Chad Correna in the description if you want to know more. And if you come to San Miguel, I would definitely recommend you give it a try and visit the tea factories. If you have an afternoon to spare, there is a nice hike among the tea plantations that is worth a look, as it makes you feel like you are somewhere else, like in Asia. On this, have a great day, stay curious, and I see you in the next one. Tschüss!